All right, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Antron Watson. I'm with uh, AARP Massachusetts. I'm the age friendly director here um, in our state office. I just want to thank you for joining us for another Livable Wednesday uh, series that really highlights a variety of ways volunteers, organizations, um, and municipalities across Massachusetts are paying increased attention to the environmental, economic, and social factors that influence the health and well being of people as they age. Um, so throughout the day, the, the program this, this afternoon, um, I want to make sure you're putting your questions into uh, the Q&A feature. Um, Yolando and myself will make sure we get answers for you um, on that. Um, and, you know, just wanna, that's a good place for us to keep track of the questions you're, a, you're asking us. Um, if you put it in chat, no worries. We'll find it and we'll try to make sure we get it answered for you today. Um, so as you may already know, AARP has been working to promote the health and well-being of older Americans for more than 60 years uh, through information, advocacy, and resources. Part of that includes helping to improve the places we live so that we can all thrive regardless of age, ability, and background. So we all want to live in places where you know, there are transportation options, housing is affordable, and works for our needs as we age. Uh, we also think about, you know, is there access to the outdoors, parks, public spaces, and are there ways for us to stay connected with loved ones and neighbors, uh, really that social connection aspect. Ultimately, our vision is for a future in which communities, urban, suburban, and rural, and rural are great places for all, especially people 50 plus. Today, I'm pleased to talk about walkability. Um, really ensuring that walking is a safe, accessible, and convenient alternative for people who cannot or choose not to drive is essential to determining how well we can engage in our communities. Now more than ever, it's critical for communities to become more pedestrian-friendly um, in order to, to reverse the trends in pedestrian fatalities and injuries. So I'm honored to be joined by an organization who is actively working to increase pedestrian safety, as well as educate and empower residents to take part in positive change. Um, I've honestly said a lot, so I'm really gonna introduce our guest speaker today, um, Yolando Spinola, who is from Walk Massachusetts. Um, and I'll toss it to you, Yolando. Please tell us more about Walk Massachusetts and, and what you all do. Thank you so much, Antron, and I also want to thank ARP for hosting us. Um, Walk Massachusetts is a pedestrian advocacy organization, uh, and we very much want to see how we can make our communities more walkable. And we're so happy that organizations like ARP are on our side to see how we can improve these things and improve uh, the pedestrian experience in many of our communities. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, walkability, and I want to talk about uh, why we need uh, pedestrian advocacy. Um, uh, in Walk Massachusetts is one player here in Massachusetts that's trying to lead that effort and, and move it forward. And I know I'm, today I'm talking to folks who are uh, meeting, joining us from across the country and hopefully some of the lessons that we have learned and some of the work that we're doing can somehow imp uh, uh, you know, inspire you all or uh, uh, kind of provide you all with some resources and some knowledge on how you can improve walkability in your own communities too and some of the different other places in the country. Uh, in regard, I have a presentation that I'll be sharing, so I'm just going to pull that up real quickly here. So uh, yeah, uh, I told you a little bit about Walk Massachusetts. We want to encourage uh, impacting the built environment so that it's uh, better for our health, better for our environment, and more vibrant communities. We want to do that through walking, and we believe walking uh, allow, like if we can allow more people to have access to uh, more walkable, safer places, um, we end up getting those type of outcomes. And uh, we want to see that regardless, pe for people to have access to walking, regardless of race, their identity, their age, uh, their lived experience, um, regardless of the zip code, um, people should have access to walking in their community. Um, and we so we we have different values that we're trying to move forward on uh, this work, uh, definitely community equity. And we we know we need to do all of this in partnership with others. We can't do it ourselves here in Massachusetts. We just uh, we're in the process of changing our name. 
we've been doing this work uh, throughout Massachusetts for over 20 years. So uh, we, we um, for a long time, been known as Walk Boston, but we know that like it, it, the work can't just be around our metropolitan areas. It has to be uh, everywhere. And um, so we've been in the process of changing our name. So now we're Walk Massachusetts. So some of these slides actually still need to be updated as I see here. We have Walk Boston, but uh, we are now Walk Massachusetts. Uh, and we believe that there's a lot of benefits to improving walking that uh, people don't even sometimes think about. Uh, if you make our communities more walkable, they become more affordable. Uh, people have access to great amenities like restaurants and grocery stores, and they don't need to get into their cars to access these things. They can save money on fuel, which is it keeps going up uh, every other day and uh, is becoming more and more uh, harder for people to move around their communities. Um, it helps with accessibility. It gives people a variety of new ways to move around. Um, if you improve the, the walking uh, environment, it, it improves some of the other mobility options too that people have in their community. And, and it helps uh, our transportation planners think about mobility more holistically. Um, and it improves uh, people's health outcomes. Uh, people want to walk around their communities, but sometimes they're just not designed in that way. And uh, and that has some negative health outcomes in regards to like the air that people are breathing because they have to get into cars and move around. Um, it has ha negative health outcomes because they're just not getting the exercise that they deserve. Um, and, you know, obesity rates are higher in less walkable places. Um, and then it, it also has an impact on our environment. Less walkable places, uh, you know, have more issues with uh, micro particles that are in our drinking water, um, less walkable places are, uh, people devote a lot more land to parking um, and uh, people are not uh, thinking about like, how are we mitigating some of our dependency on fossil fuels? So if we create more walkable places, our environment does get better and it helps with social cohesion. Um, we've, uh, we, uh, Walk Massachusetts actually, has taken part in some research with uh, Mass Inc., which is a nonprofit organization here in Massachusetts. And we looked at some of the different gateway cities here um, in our state. And we've realized that uh, by improving walkability and improving um, some of these different uh, built environment pieces, we can really Im improve uh, the social infrastructure that people have access to. So it, it's more chances for people to connect with each other in uh, you know, a civilized and enjoyable way and allows people to see each other's faces and uh, be in environments where they can start to think about things together and think about like how they can improve their communities. Um, and it helps with economic resiliency. People are visiting shops more um, and they are thinking about like how they can uh, improve things that they might see when they're walking around. And then it also helps with um, fostering innovation and cross-pollination. So all those things are uh, pieces that we've realized through our research. Uh, so walkability has an impact on uh, social infrastructure and social cohesion. I highly recommend that you all check out uh, that research that we've done, but uh, we have we do work on walkability throughout the state uh, in a variety of different ways. It's not just research. Um, another example that I wanna share with you all today is um, in East Boston, I get I get to uh, take part in these walking groups that um, uh, it's a, a partnership that we have with Green Roots. And basically, uh, it allows us to think about how we can support people accessing green spaces and parks. Uh, it's a, like a really informal way for us to do community engagement and get feedback around the built environment. Uh, so it's basically these this group comes together every week and they walk from one specific location that they designate beforehand to a park. And then they uh, try to identify some of the different issues that they see along the way. Uh, it might be speeding. It might be like issues with uh, lack of crosswalks or uh, crack, you know, cracks on the sidewalks or maybe not, not enough trees. Um, and they also talk about some other things that they might see in their community that might make it just less pleasant for walking around. Uh, maybe it's tension with um, uh, with businesses in the area or new development or construction. And they'll let us know about those things and we get to make feedback, give feedback to 
the city of Boston or other partners who are uh, collecting insights for their own planning efforts. Uh, so that's one way that we are uh, doing this advocacy work and uh, collecting insights through walking and through uh, engaging the community. Uh, we also have innovated this new uh, way that we're conducting walk audits. Walk audits is a way that uh, a lot of folks get to understand what's, uh, what is the built environment for pedestrians, and then they make recommendations to decision makers. Uh, but COVID forced us basically to think about how we uh, build the capacity for walk audits uh, uh, because we couldn't uh, meet in person or we couldn't uh, congregate folks to uh, conduct these walk audits. So we had to brainstorm how are we going to allow folks to learn about walk audits um, on their own pace virtually. Uh, so we developed like these series of videos that allow folks to learn about the process of how to conduct the walk audit and how they can uh, form groups and collect that data and then eventually make recommendations to decision makers. So we basically develop, developed our own like walk audit academy. Uh, we still do our, we're still very much advocates on uh, conducting walk audits in the old typical format uh, and that we lead um, and get folks to uh, give recommendations to us and we generate the report. But this is a new way for us to like conduct walk audits where a variety of folks can learn about the process and conduct it themselves and make the recommendations to their decision maker. So we got to pilot this example uh, in Worcester uh, this last year and it really uh, generated a lot of great insights that was uh, presented to um, uh, key decision makers in Worcester. Uh, so and that's a, a great format. And walk audits are a, a format that I think ARP does a great job of providing a lot of resources on too. So definitely want to recommend that you all check out their resources on their website to see how you can, uh, you know, organize your own walk audits to find out what are the issues locally in regards to the built environment so you can make the right recommendations to your uh, municipalities. Uh, some of the, th these are just some images that, one of the groups um, were able to identify during their walk audits, just like as an example, there was a lot of like cracked sidewalks. They also identified some positive things too that they wanted to show. Okay, uh, we love that there was some signage in the area that uh, made, you know, created more sense of community. Um, we we did like that there was this bike rack, um, but we, you know, this, the the crosswalks could be improved. The ramps were uh, not ADA compliant. Um, some of the some of the different uh, sidewalks are just like completely crumbling. Um, so those are some they they highlighted some of these different pieces, and it, it was a part of a larger presentation that went to the transportation planner in Worcester and uh, other key decision makers were in the room and they heard these uh, recommendations through a presentation and uh, a report that was shared with those uh, folks. Uh, so we know that like walkability is important and we have to like make those recommendations, uh, not just for pedestrians who are using our sidewalks today, day to day, but we need to start thinking about how we can improve our walking environment for the future and a lot, uh, a lot of folks who are uh, trying to age in place and are uh, living in their community now, but and, and they have access to a lot of things. But if we don't make the improvements uh, quicker and we don't make them, uh, you know, in a more holistic way, in an equitable way, you know, we can really leave a lot of people behind and they're not going to be able to move around their communities appropriately. So we're really thinking about how do we improve walkability specifically to create more age friendly uh, places. And we came up with a resource that uh, at least allows folks to think about uh, creating like age-friendly communities and impacting the built environment uh, with like small little changes that could be made. Like, so we just put together like a, a one pager and I'll put the link in our chat. Um, but there's like some small recommendations that you could easily provide to your municipality and to decision makers locally that would improve walkability for uh, to make it uh, make, make your community more age friendly, uh, improving lighting, adding more benches, improving um, improving the uh, speed in your municipality. Uh, maybe it's slowing the speed down specifically. Um, it, it, all these things have a huge impact for um, older folks who want to move around their community. And we've been doing this work uh, in Massachusetts, and we actually had a huge win here in Massachusetts where 
uh, municipalities now have the control, they have the ability to actually reduce speeds before uh, there was more um, barriers in, in reducing local speeds. Um, and MassDOT had a lot more uh, say on that. And there was more uh, hoops that you had to jump through. But I'll add a link into the chat that shows that win and how municipalities can now advocate uh, to reduce their speed locally. And uh, hopefully your municipality is already listed there. Or if it's not, maybe you need to think about how you can connect with MassDOT and local decision makers to lower speed. Um, and we also advocate around uh, snow because we want people to move around their community all year long, uh, not, not just during the, the great uh, summer months and spring months, uh, but we want people to um, move around their communities regardless of weather. So like, how could we start to uh, you know, rethink about how we clean up our snow and who's responsible for what? And we wanna make it all cl more clear locally here in Massachusetts um, around like uh, snow removal and um, allowing folks to move around their community because we know that it's a big barrier for a lot of folks, is specifically folks who have mobility issues. It shouldn't be that during the winter months, we're basically like forcing people to be locked up in, in their homes or that they have to get into a vehicle to uh, move around their communities. Um, so right now, there's a, still a lot of work to be done on this, but uh, we're going to come out with this tool uh, shortly in a few more months that will at least allow folks to understand like wh wh who who's responsible for what when it comes to snow removal and how uh, could we advocate uh, locally for, um, for, for snow removal to be better for people to walk around their community. Um, and then the last piece is uh, a, a, some, some unfortunate news, which is we have actually been seeing a number of um, the number of fatal uh, pedestrian crashes increase here in Massachusetts. So, um, you know, we've been engaging in this work for a while, but there's still a lot of work to be done in Massachusetts. And um, we have we saw an increase of uh, fatal crashes this year. And um, the, the the issue, we, we looked at it through an environmental justice lens, and it has even more impact on Black and Brown communities. And we know that uh, folks who are older actually are the majority of the victims, too, when it comes to um, dealing with um, with the current conditions that we have. Um, and, and they are, you know, uh, dying at a disproportional rate um, from these fatal crashes. Um, and we had a whole report that came out, and I can also add that link into the chat so you all can do a, a deeper dive into that report. Um, definitely some municipalities were hit harder than others, like Chicopee, which is uh, not uh, significantly smaller than Boston, had just as many um, fatal crashes uh, that killed pedestrians um, as Boston. And uh, we know that some places need to uh, really rethink about how they uh, change their built environment so that we can, we can really take a action on this uh, unfortunate trend. Um, and yeah, so this is just a map that shows some of the different areas where we saw uh, an increase of uh, crashes that um, had a, uh, an increase of fatal pedestrians. Um, so I'll just leave that up for one second. And I guess like what can folks do locally in Massachusetts? There's a lot of things you could do. Um, I, I can I continue to talk about walk audits once uh, we get into the Q&A section of this, but um, also just reporting the problems locally is a, a, a big thing. And Walk Massachusetts has put a whole tool together on our website uh, that is just like how to report a problem. Uh, there's so many different uh, layers to reporting a problem in Massachusetts. Uh, you know, you have you get to report it low. You might have to report it locally um, through your municipality, and that might be uh, reporting it on an app like 311 or C Click Fix, or maybe you you have to send a specific email to. Uh, your decision makers, or uh, it, maybe the road is owned by another different entity like MassDOT. Um, so you have to uh, connect with them or connect with your regional planning agency. But we know that it's complicated and it changes from municipality to municipality. So we have this tool that we developed where you can just click on your specific location and we give you step-by-step -step recommendations on how you can report the problem that you see um, in your municipality. Um, 
but that's just one option. Again, there, there's a variety of different ways to do advocacy. And we think reporting a problem at least is at least the first step that you should consider taking. Um, but if you want to continue to connect with us, uh, these are just some upcoming uh, things that we have that are always um, that happen with us every year. We have a statewide network committee that is the third of um, the third Wednesday of every month at 1 p.m. And if you go on our website, you can um, access what the topic is uh, um, for any given month. And then you can join the call and uh, uh, take part in like uh, know, like start to learn about what other folks are doing and how that could uh, implicate your own work. And you can let folks know what you're doing locally. And then we have um, uh, less less frequent, we have a, a this thing called Talk the Walk, which is we invite one um, thought leader to come and talk to us specifically about what the, you know their insights around uh, the uh, walking environment or walkability or pedestrian advocacy. Um, so they'll join us. And um, the next one that we have coming up is called What the Tech. This, the date is still to be determined, but again, it'll be on our website under the Talk the Walk section. And then we have a walk that happens every year. It's a walk that is basically like, um, it, it, you basically can participate on it on your own and you track how many steps that you're taking and how many, um, uh, uh, like how your distance yourself, but it's an opportunity to connect with the, a variety of people throughout the state and they get to walk basically the perimeter of Massachusetts. And it's an opportunity for you to just like connect with folks and uh, be active also during the time of the year, maybe when a lot of folks are starting to bundle up and not go outside, which is during the November month. It's called Beat the Bay State and it's a, a fundraiser that we also host. And then we have our annual meeting that happens every year and we just had it this year. And it's an opportunity for us to acknowledge some of the good work that's being done in Massachusetts. And we give out awards to uh, folks who are moving our communities to be more uh, walkable and pedestrian friendly. Uh, so th those are some things that I just wanted to share with you all today. And uh, this is my contact information, but I want to take questions uh, from the audience and uh, yeah, just to see how I could best be a support to you all. Yolando, thank you. This was so much more than just, you know, walking, you know, I think we all know that, you know, walking involves a lot. Um, but, you know, one of the things you said early on was really around partnerships. Um, and that we can't do this by ourselves, you know, as organizations. Um, it's 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 not easy. Um, and and it's individuals like those on the on the call here, the advocates in the community whose voices ring louder than ours. Um, and I think you said that. Yeah, you may have said that, um, but I just wanted to call it out again because it's it's very important uh, to all of this work, you know, around affordability, health, social um, connections, accessibility, all those items you you brought up. And it seems very um for it seems very easy. In, in some cases. Um, so one question that actually came in the chat while you, while you were going was, you know, when we talk about the infrastructure changes, um, how, you know, communities, there's the walkers, there's the bikers, and there's the cars. How do you address the situations where the it's not necessarily the cars that are having the um, incidents with pedestrians, but the bicyclists? And, and how, how can, you know, residents make their communities aware of maybe the changes they've made for bike lanes are, are now not safe for pedestrians themselves. Yeah, I, I would say that the, um, the place to start with a lot of this stuff is relationships. I think like we need to build relationships with folks who are choosing different modes of transportation and different advocacy groups. Um, we um, walk Massachusetts, uh, we do a good job of connecting with folks who are advocating uh, for those other modes and are thinking and encouraging municipalities to redesign things uh, for for those modes. And we want, I think like it, it's good to be in the room and to have those relationships with them so that we're all advocating for the same things and so that we're thinking about each other when we're advocating for those things and designing our communities. Um, yeah, there's going to be changes that are coming down the pipeline uh, when it comes to like our built environment. We know the status quo isn't working, and it's uh, and it causes a lot of harm for a variety of different folks who are uh, moving around our communities. Uh, so we need uh, to redesign things, um, and we we want to redesign them for the better. So like it, the best thing for us to do is connect with each other and uh, be in the room and give each other the feedback, um, so that we can uh, redesign our communities together and not in silos and then have conflict. 
Um, so I definitely encourage folks to connect with uh, the cyclist, uh, uh, you know, advocacy groups locally, and to um, to connect with uh, other folks who are advocating for other transportation modes and trying to see like how do we make it all work. Um, it, you know, it doesn't it doesn't necessarily need to be that uh, one a win for one is a loss for another. I think like it, we can uh, create a conditions where you know everyone prospers and we can all move around safely. Um, but it, it requires us to like build relationships and connect with each other. I love it. I love that answer. You know, I think you said collaboration is key uh, to this, and you know, a variety of levels. Um, and really not, uh, breaking down those silos between you know different organizations and, and and folks groups I should say not even organizations. Um, another question um, that that I, I I've seen is. You know, I think this may be our last question, um, but please continue to put questions in. Um, the next question I have is, you know, you do this walk audit, you pull this nice report together or a person group pulls a, a walk audit together. Um, what do they do with that report? What does what does that look like? What is the timing on it? You know, does it can we get changes overnight is my the simple question. Yeah, unfortunately, transportation changes r rarely happen overnight. They definitely are. It takes um, you know a constant civic engagement uh, to get the changes that we want to see um, over you know uh, a, a number of years sometimes, uh, but it, it, that's you know that's a system that we have. That's the you know democracy is uh, a participatory sport, and basically to be involved in um, in pedestrian advocacy, you you want it to take a part in your democracy. So uh, you don't want that report to sit on a shelf. Uh, in some transportation planner's office, um, and you don't want it just to be sent to the city council and that's it, but you want to uh, constantly be reminding um, those key decision makers of those recommendations of that specific report and plan. Um, you know, definitely uh, try to memorize and, 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 and keep some of those key recommendations top of mind when you're meeting with key decision makers um, and letting them know like, hey, uh, I noticed that we're making, like letting them know about the progress that has been made uh, and some of the, the wins, but then letting them know what still needs to be done uh, and keeping that top of mind is key. Um, and it, it, it's going to take, usually there's a lot of different jurisdictions when it comes to changing our transportation infrastructure. So you have to be able to connect with a variety of different folks who are trying to um, change our transportation infrastructure. So, you know, it's it's your uh, city council, it's your, uh, or uh, or select board, uh, you know, it's city manager or town manager or uh, mayor, you, you're connecting with one of those different entities, but definitely the Department of Transportation in your state and, and or like connecting with the regional planning agencies. So there's so many different players, but you have to bring that plan or bring some of those recommendations to all these different players so that they can start to uh, know of them and and uh, move those those pieces forward. Um, so it's it, yeah, it's ongoing civic engagement with all of the the our, the folks who make up our um, our democracy, basically, our local democracies. Ah, that's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and what I really like there is that, you know, you, you mentioned it in your presentation, you mentioned it again here. Um, bring up the positives too, um, you know, as, as, a, as a way of always showing that you are doing some good stuff, you know, our, our leadership, um, as well as, you know, here's some other issues that we've seen along the way. So I, I really appreciate that. And, and I appreciate you um, really coming here today to talk more about walkability and, and how that really impacts, you know, our communities as a whole. Um, so thank you for thanks. Thank you so much for sharing that today. Um, you really provided some wonderful details um, around safety as well. Um, and how that impacts our communities.